Welcome. My name is Kelly Bearden. I'm a classical musician turned creative entrepreneur, and this is the best platform for musicians that are looking to shape their career by thinking outside the box. Tara, I'm excited for today talking about your career path because it's not just teaching and it's not just playing, but you've also uh, created a lot of content and created a whole method series, which is really exciting. But I want to start at the very, very beginning, if that's okay. So at what age did you start playing piano? Uh, I was about four and a half when I started. On the young side. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Why did you start? Was it more driven by your parents or was it something that you were interested in? Uh, I love this story. So um, my neighbor was a singer and I would, she would give voice lessons. So I'd go over to her house and I would just sit there and watch her lessons. And obviously she would like do scales and stuff and warm ups for her students. And every time she'd go to the door to greet the next student, like I would run to the piano and like try and imitate her scales or whatever she had done, like just the warm up exercises. And that went on for six months. And then she finally was like, okay, maybe I shouldn't tell Tara's mom <laughs> that this is happening. <laughs> She's like, Tara probably wants to do piano. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then I was like, you, you should get her a piano. So my mom saved up money, 20 little dollar bills aside after giving all her, like, um, she would tutor um, mm. and got me a piano. And then it's been really hard to get me off the piano. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I don't know many four and a half year olds that are that like self-driven into music. I know at that age, a lot of the students that I see, it's more driven by their parents. So it's fun to hear. Oh, and, it. Yeah, it's, it was totally an obsession <laughs> for a very long time. And even that neighbor, they gave me, and I can see it. It's a little blue piano toy. And mm. I was obsessed with it. Like I had the pink Panther and it just, I, and I don't know. I just loved I on piano 24 seven, just messing oh, around. That is so cool. Mm-hmm. When did you know that piano was what you wanted to do for a career? That's a good question because I started teaching when I was 14. I'd played Mm -hmm. forever. Like I loved it, but I was, when I went to college, I was like, I don't know if I want to teach forever. And then I Mm -hmm. studied music therapy and I I kept teaching alongside while I was studying. Um, But then I, with my degree, I was like, I realized music therapy, you have to follow really strict guidelines and you have to do these evaluations. and And I was like, I have to follow someone else's rules and I don't like that. I like Mm. following my own rules and being the boss. So I incorporate a lot of psychology into my teaching, but I was like, I want to be my own boss. And I realized I loved teaching. And then I, it just, as soon as I got back from college, it literally blew up in within Mm. um, a year I had 40 plus students. So I was like, okay, well, I guess this is what I need to be doing. And because I have the freedom to do what I want, which is create. And I loved creating and I want to, I love fixing problems. Like I, I want it, I want piano to be easy for kids. And so it's like, <laughs> I don't know. So I didn't always know I wanted to teach for sure. I knew I loved it. Mm. I always knew I wanted to do something with kids and music like that hands down, which makes sense why I went into music therapy, but. That's awesome. So it's obviously you've got this big intrinsic drive. And so as you're looking, yes. you know, in your teenage years at the rest of your life and figuring out what you're going to do music therapy and, and, particular, obviously kids and music and that ties in, but did you have experience in music therapy before you started college? Is that something that you'd like? That was like, I, yeah, I, I chose certain (laughs) colleges or the colleges that offered that there were only three in California. Um, I went to Chapman, so they had that there and I'm, I've always been fascinated by psychology in general too. Like I love Mm. that stuff. So it was part, it was half psychology, half music. Um, and yeah, it was like the perfect mix. And it, I am actually really grateful I have that degree because I, I incorporate so much of that into my method and the way I teach. And yeah, it's very heavy in the way I teach it and create That's things. awesome. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. What do you think some of the things that students, when we look at more traditional method books and things that are more popular on the market, mm-hmm. where are some areas that you feel either those are generally lacking and it's totally fine. Like this is not a, a criticism oh, yeah. of them, but what are some things that because those are lacking, maybe you focused on a little bit more in your method or how you approach oh, it differently. Okay. This gets me going. Okay. Two things. <laughs> uh, let me start with a theory because, uh, because my favorite part of this would be like the pop song method, like ear training. Mm-hmm. I think that's super lacking in, in general. Like everyone is so focused on reading, reading, reading. Yes. It is so important. I even created a 
tool, note match that helps to read music. Cause I want it to be easy for kids. And, but I feel like theory is so important and you can definitely teach kids theory in a fun way, not in those ugh, boring black and white books that like <laughs> kids will like look at it and be like, ah, why? No. Why are you opening this again? No, I don't want to do this. You know? So I have a really colorful theory book and my entire program, like two of the modules are completely dedicated to that. And I even mm. have a teacher. She's like, I'm teaching my daughter. She teaches her daughter too. Like she's working on her scales and then her diminished chords and her seventh chords. And like, she wants to do these. And I'm like, yes. And even the teacher, she learned, she actually studied music and she learned this stuff in college. She's like, I don't know why I wasn't taught this earlier. And she's teaching her kids this at six, seven, mm. eight. Like you can teach at a young age. So the theory is one thing. The, like I said, the pop method that I created, um, I literally, it's, it's horrible because I could just want to talk about it all day. Uh, but I think there's a huge lack in ear training. Um, mm -hmm. It's all about reading, blah, blah, blah. But it's also, you need to be listening. And the better yes. you are with your ear, the easier it is to learn music too. So I don't know why it's not like put at the forefront. And yeah. using this method, like picking up any pop song or... And I say pop song. I don't want teachers to be like, oh, I don't care about pop. It's literally picking up any song by ear. It doesn't even have to have words. It could be instrumental. It's picking music up by ear, anything. like you. So hearing the melody, being able to pick out the chords below it, like developing that side is so important. And I love this method because I, I hook kids within the first piano lesson. Like they literally are drooling by the end. They're like, they don't want it to be over. They're asked their mom and dad, like, when is the next one? Like, they can't wait. <laughs> All they want is to feel cool and show off to their friends the newest song that's on the radio that they can play, even at a super young age. Like, they don't have to be able to read complicated music to play these popular songs. So, yes. Well, I think what's so beautiful. exciting about this, too, is there's so many... And look, for every single teacher, there's a, a fit with a student. And for every single student, there's an ideal teacher. This goes both ways. And some students and some teachers like that more competitive, strictly classical approach. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But for the students that are learning because they just want to have fun and they want it to be something they yes. can play what they're hearing in Disney movies or on the radio. And that is the motivation for them is the things that they would want to listen to. They also want to be able to play. It is hard. Like it takes a long time for our students to get to a point where they can play, you know, even like the songs they want. At, yeah, like piano adventures, like the the primer level and then the supplement they've got like the Disney and pop and jazz and everything yes. supplement to that. Those are as difficult as the end of the primer book. Yes. So you have to get them through like months mm -hmm. of basic information before this happens. So it makes a ton of sense to try to get them there faster because they will be more excited and it, it sparks that for them long-term. Yes. It's more of a long-term passion. Totally. That's awesome. What inspired you to start writing your own method? Was it just these things that you felt was lacking and you started creating materials or did you say one day like, I'm going to make my own method book and uh, start yeah, from no, scratch. I, I feel like it's never really like that. It's just, it just happened. So I got mm. back from college in 2010 and just started teaching. And I noticed I kept in each of my students' books, like I was, I was really big on teaching them scales and doing this and chords. I was huge on chords. I should even say that first. Uh, but I would put like these grids in the back of their book and I'd do like a C chord, a, a D, uh, and then they have to do check marks once they know how to do it the right hand, the left hand. And like I started noticing I did this for all my students. So mm. I plugged it into Microsoft Words and my husband and brother were like, uh, Tara, why are you doing this in Microsoft Words? This is so dumb. So I started uh, putting these grids in the back of each of the kids' books. And oh, yeah, then my husband and <laughs> brother thought it was ridiculous that I was doing it in Microsoft Word. So I ended up putting it in Photoshop finally. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I realized I had this whole theory book. Um, and so that's how that one was born. It took me five years to get it like on Amazon and looking really pretty. Cause I, I would just print them at FedEx and bind them and sell them to all my families and students. Um, and then, so I had that book and I was like, well, I know as a kid, like you don't like reading and having all these instructions. So the issue with my theory book is there's no instructions in it. It's literally mm. the most colorful book you see. It's a lot of it is coloring in shapes because I want kids to be motivated. That's the psychology behind it to learn a concept. And as soon as they learn a concept, they color in a bubble and then they're like, Oh my gosh, I want to color another one. So then they, how, what, yeah. So they just want to learn, learn, learn. Um, so I had that theory book, but I was like, how do teachers know how to use it? And that's how my whole program was born. Mm. So I started developing and, 
filming videos and showing how I teach each of these concepts and core progressions and scales and inversions and literally everything. Um, but then I also realized I was using note match that tool to help read music and then also my pop method. So all of that went into this one program and then fast forward to COVID and me being pregnant. Um, I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm about to have a kid in nine months and not that my life is going to be over, but it's going to be really hard to get anything done. It's like, I, I, I need to do all these things that are on my list and no idea how, but I literally popped out 14 books within nine months. <laughs> Like that's more than one book a month. It's mind blowing. I I don't even know. It's mind blowing to me. Like five years in the first one, and then just in a couple months, you just whip out fourteen more. Yep, I have no idea. And some of them, some of them were easier to do, obviously, than others. Like uh, the practice books, I would do these little hundred days of practice, and it makes these super cute shapes that kids color. Obviously, if you guys haven't noticed, I'm all about color and something very colorful. (laughs) I hate the black and white, (laughs) even though piano is black and white. Sorry, ironic. (laughs) Um, but. Yeah, I didn't try. I'm like, oh, I'm going to create them. It just literally just happened. And my, I'm very creative and I need to be busy with my hands and create. And, and it just, I don't have enough hours in the day to do everything I want. Like I have a lifetime of things to do. So. It, well, it's, I think this is a common thing for a lot of musicians is we tend to split focus a lot. Like an, an average person coming out mm-hmm. of music school looks at their past experience of playing in ensembles, maybe playing some new music and things that their friends have been working on. Maybe they're composing if that's something they've taken up an interest in. Um, you know, they usually have multiple genres that they're working on. Maybe they want to teach a little bit. They probably want to take auditions. And the career feels a little too open-ended, I think. Mm-hmm. There's so many things that you could do that it's paralyzing yes. Yes. in a lot of ways. So when you finished school and you decided, okay, I want to be my own boss. I'm mm-hmm. entrepreneurial. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go work with another studio or even work for another music therapy program. What happened next? Like, what did you do following school to start to narrow your focus and how did you decide where you wanted to end up? Um, so it kind of just happened again, like everything just kind of always happened. (laughs) Um, graduated, but I had to do a six month internship and Mm -hmm. I'm so happy that my internship happened to me in Sacramento, which is about like an hour and a half from where I live. So I would, do my internship Monday through Friday in Sacramento and then stay there during the week. And then I would come back Friday afternoon and I would start teaching. And Mm -hmm. I had my little, I started having these new students again when I was officially back, you know, home, even just on weekends. And within the seven months, like my entire weekend was booked, like Friday all the way to like seven or eight. And then I work all day Saturday and Sunday. And then I would drive early Monday morning back to my internship. And I just couldn't wait for my internship to be over because my wait list (laughs) was ridiculous and I got back, like, as soon as my internship was done, like, I was working seven days a week teaching mm. with 40 plus students. And it was, it, it was obviously too much. Like, I was like, I can't maintain this. And then I started, like, training my older students who were in high school, because I started teaching at 14, but I didn't have anyone to show me anything. So, like, I was like, <laughs> oh, gosh, not only have, have I been teaching these kids my method, like, and I have all these little kids that are on my wait list and want lessons, like, I hated throwing money away. So I was like, okay. I'm going to give you these little kids. And anyway, so my students started teaching for me and then they would be maxed out because obviously high school students can't take on a, right. like a huge load. Um, and then I started outsourcing, looking for other teachers. So it just like all happened. I forget the initial thing you asked me, but I know that we're there. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So on this path post-school, I mean, it seems like everything happened really, really fast. Yes. What were some things that made that growth so successful for you? And what do you feel like helped influence the speed in which you grew your studio and, and created the program? Uh, I think the way that I was teaching, because like I hmm. just graduated from college. I actually had had theory classes because I didn't before. Um, or I hadn't had very many. Um, I mean, I did study at the conservatory of San Francisco and I was in the prep division. So, but I was taking, um, actually just piano lessons with one of the Mm. the professors. Um, but, and aside from doing scales and Hannon and learning these fancy pieces, like I didn't really have actual theory courses. So I implemented a lot of theory, but then obviously I, I promise you, like, the pop method is what had kids lining up at my door. Like I remember Mm. some of my very early students, like even Saturday morning, I'd go and I I don't know why I have this memory of this boy, Alexander, but he struggled with reading and 
teaching him the pop songs is like what made him want to keep learning. So many of my kids, like they were just frustrating reading. It was hard yeah. and it, they want to give up. But if, anyway, so I, 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 hands down, like I can't say enough about the pop. I'm like, this is literally has <laughs> kids lining up at my door because of it. What do your students want to play the most right now? Like what is the most popular request or couple requests that you're getting for new music? Uh, right now it's a golden hour. Mm. Oh yeah. That's like oh. the new thing. And I'm actually doing a I love TikTok. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I guess he's all about TikTok. Um <gasps> it's just it's literally it's all the newest ones like uh Taylor Swift, mm -hmm. uh Ed Sheeran, um I mean I'm, any any new song they want to learn. Right? Yeah. That's awesome. So no, I'm sure like six yeah. months ago it was all we don't talk about Bruno and Oh my gosh. We yeah. had a lot of I had Piano Club and all my little kids wanted to learn that one. I was like, that is a hard one because it's all in the blacks, but sure, let's it learn is it. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. And the rhythm is tough in that one too. I know I, I pulled a transcription. I actually had a friend help me transcribe because I don't love to transcribe. It's not necessarily my uh my preferred way to spend <laughs> my time. And so I had a colleague transcribe it for me for clarinet and Every single one of my students ended up playing it, even if they hadn't requested it. They heard other kids playing it in the uh -huh. lesson before. They're like, that, mm -hmm. I want that. <laughs> but see, that's why it's I love tough. the pop method because I'm not, yeah. they do not see rhythm written out. They do not have to worry yeah. about reading rhythm. It's literally using your ear. And since they know the song, they know the rhythm. So it's just figuring out what the notes are on the piano or any, literally any instrument that that. Yeah. They would work on other instruments. It doesn't even need to be piano. So oh. I'm curious because obviously th this is, you know, a, a little bit different than a lot of the methods that are on the market, but I also mm -hmm. think it's so driven by what your students are asking for. But at the same time, I'm, I'm guessing it's probably driven by the way that you prefer to learn as well. So when you were growing up, were you teaching yourself a lot of songs by ear? That's very funny. So I was really good with my ear and I asked my teacher mm -hmm. to play stuff so that I would know what it sounds like. So it would help me. But I was terrible at reading notes. Mm -hmm. Terrible. And I see all my kids today, they are literally so good at reading at such a younger age than I was. And that's because of no match. Hmm. Yeah. So having so, it gamified helps. And then also giving them music that they're really motivated yes. to practice and to play helps. Yeah. I mean, and I know I'm heavy on talking about the pop method, but I, it is so, and I use it as like a treat and a candy. I dangle it. I'm like, okay, mm. first we do our pieces with notes and then we can go play our pop songs. So Got it. you better bet you that they are working on their notes <laughs> pieces because all they want to do is play the pop music. Yeah. It's fun too. Like I even use uh, I, like that 101, you know, Disney songs, like some of those compilations mm -hmm. from Hal yeah. Leonard. I will use that in the same way after audition season for a lot of my mm -hmm. high school students. Like we just sight read Disney music and it's great because yeah. the rhythms are challenging in yes. all of those pieces. Like yep. there's a lot of complicated content in there, you know, different key signatures, a lot of accidentals yes. and it's a good thing for them to learn. And it's also great because they are more in tune with the self-reflection like they'll play something wrong and they always know it's wrong yes as opposed to when we're playing mozart and yep. like they count something for too short and i'm hearing it but unless yeah they're they super, super familiar they are not totally i feel there's a huge happening. lack of kids listening to classical music i grew up listening mm -hmm. to it i'm obsessed with classical music and i know i don't talk about it here but it's literally like my fire and i could listen to it all mm -hmm. day play it all day like it's but i never force that on kids but i love my pop method is what gets kids excited about piano. And when they're 12, 13, they actually start wanting to be challenged. And a lot, like mm. a lot of my kids stop the pop songs or they keep doing them on their own. They don't need me anymore. And they want to learn classical music. That's like literally like rainbows <laughs> and butterflies. <laughs> and like, yes. Oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> I'm learning classical when music. When they make that first request for, for release, oh. like the sky is open. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Or any of the classical music. Cause they want, oh, that's and, awesome. Like, they, like, advanced, advanced stuff, you know, yeah. like stuff that I loved learning. So, well, and because they're ready for it too, I think yeah. you get to skip some of those things that aren't mm -hmm. as exciting or showy. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. that's where you can lose kids sometimes is it's just yeah. not what they're super motivated by. So that's, that makes total sense. Yeah. Okay. So zooming out a little bit on your yeah. whole career. So obviously you're teaching, you've got the, the method and you've got a training program around the method. Mm -hmm you also have children and <laughs> you are functioning right now independently in raising them. And that's been a change in the last few years, I know for you, but yes. this is a lot to balance. So yes. what are some of the things that help you to balance 
everything that's on your plate? What are some of the tips that maybe you would share with another teacher or entrepreneur if they are also trying to figure out like, oh my goodness, I have kids. Can I, can I make this work? What yes. makes this work for you? Oh gosh, I don't know where to start. One, <laughs> I don't want to discourage any. It's literally like been my life dream to be a mom. Like that's what I wanted. Um, I don't know. Obviously, everyone listening doesn't know. Obviously, maybe my story. I'll just mm -hmm. say it. Like my husband passed away over a year ago, um, unexpectedly. So it's been a lot. I was six weeks yeah. pregnant when he passed. So I had to go through all of that, like uh, nine months of basically grief, being pregnant and managing my, at the time, one-year-old. So now I have a two-year-old and a almost eight-month-old. Um, it is really hard to get any work done. <laughs> I'm just being honest, just because I'm alone, you know, unless I like pay someone. So the mm -hmm. only time I am alone is when I actually teach because they are at their babysitter because it is impossible for me to teach with them. Um, and then all the other time, because otherwise, I mean, I teach three days, but I literally work 24 seven. I mm -hmm. just want to work on my method, but I also have to be a mom and take care of the babies. So I feel I haven't figured out the balance yet. I'm just right now is he's my youngest is eight months. So I'm still not getting sleep and I'm just exhausted all the time. So I do the bare minimum of what really needs to get done instead of moving the needle forward, which is what I really want to always do. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I think respecting that too, I mean, like there's seasons for everything, yeah. right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. the season that you're in right now is not one that you ever foresaw yourself being in. Yeah. And at the same time, respecting like, okay, Tara needs sleep. <laughs> like, <laughs> you need to eat. You need time yeah. off. Like you yeah. need a few minutes alone and you mm -hmm. need to take care of yourself. Listening to that and putting that as a priority is totally fine when you're in a period where that needs to be the focus. And then in a yeah. couple of years, and exactly. obviously maybe the focus cool. can be more. Yeah. 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 So there's, there's a change in the future, obviously coming, yes. but in the meantime, when you do have a few minutes alone mm -hmm. and let's say you're not going to work on the method book, you're not going to work with your, with your students at all. They're not going to work, um, just in general, you're going to take a few minutes to yourself. What do you do for self-care? What, what uh, is helping you stay grounded or, or I just love my TV shows. <laughs> I just, <get laughs> out. I get under the covers. Um, oh, sometimes I'm just trying to work out again, a little mm -hmm. bit of working out. Um, I don't know, browse social media. I just, right now it's just, there's not, not much. I mean, it's I would okay. love to take a bath. That sounds like heaven. Oh, <laughs> but yeah, like cozy, chill. Yeah, <laughs> that would yeah involve both kids not being there. Cause it's just, you know, they just end yeah. up in the bathroom where they scream or, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a, a group, a group event. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So when you think about your business and the growth that you've had, is there any musician or any other entrepreneurs or anyone that has inspired you on this journey or that you feel like you've learned a lot from in getting to this point? Oof. Um, I feel bad, but I'm literally in my own world sometimes. I feel, mm. I mean, I love, I love seeing others and I mean, I've done several courses I love mm -hmm. business courses. I think that those have helped me a lot. Not necessarily like people doing piano stuff because I just am so stuck in my ways of teaching because it works so well. <laughs> um, but I think that business minded people and that is what has affected me and helped me grow and gotten mm -hmm. me to where I am today. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, I know you said earlier that you've always wanted to be your own boss and you've always yes. kind of had this entrepreneurial oh, yeah. spirit. Spirit. Mm -hmm. Did that start around the time that you started teaching lessons in high school or was that something that you found throughout college? Maybe as you're doing oh, your internship, like, oh, I just don't want to work with anyone else. No, I think like I grew up not a lot of money. Like I, my mm -hmm. mom's, we all struggled and I saw my mom struggle and everything um, and work extra hours just to put me through piano or ballet or put my brothers through soccer or whatever it was. Um, so I, from a very young age, I tried to be independent and not be a burden to my mom. Mm -hmm. I remember starting babysitting at 12 and I just loved counting my dollars. Like I started at $2 an hour and, um, yeah, by the time I was 14, I was teaching piano and babysitting. I'd be like booked out three months in advance for babysitting. Obviously again, just working with kids was like my heaven. Um, and then teaching piano, I just love mm. seeing the money roll in and putting in my little envelopes and counting them and saving. Like I've always been a saver <laughs> and, um, yeah. 
Are there any in your business right now? Are there any like organizational resources, tools, anything that you use that saves yourself a lot of time that you would recommend other people? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, A virtual assistant. (laughs) Hands down. Uh, So I have my school. I have a couple of teachers that work for me. Um, I hate doing invoicing and all that kind of busy Mm -hmm. work. Uh, So I hired someone to manage that. And then I realized for Cascade Method, there's so many like creating games and uploading them on all the sites and just you uh, just everything literally. So I hired someone and she's been amazing. It's been about a year now. And like my to-do list per month was ridiculous. Like, and it now last year I was pregnant. So I only had Jordan to deal with. Now I have two, like it, it's just impossible. So hiring a virtual assistant and creating systems. And I've read a book about like creating systems and that's what mm-hmm. got me started in hi- like hiring um, this woman. And it's been a game changer. Like mm-hmm. every little thing that, I, so there's this other little course I took. It's like, you have like a thousand dollar category and a $10 category. You should not be doing the $10 category. Like you should be making those systems for someone else to do because that is not worth your time. Like I need to be doing things that only I can do as in like mm-hmm. film because I want to create a new course, like, uh, and I need to film and the, no one can film other than me. Like, and then I need to edit my own stuff. <laughs> and so, um, it's really choosing really what can be delegated. I think that's yeah. the biggest advice I could give. This is hard. I think for, I mean, for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's hard for a lot of musicians. I think it's even harder because we're so used to like being fully responsible for our own work and our own output. And, you know, if you're, if you're performing, you're branded around the results of your work and your effort. And so when you're teaching, it feels the very same way. So getting to a point where we're delegating is a challenge and it it will push anyone. What are some things that you've learned or some things that have really helped you to kind of work through that so that you feel comfortable and excited now about delegating in your business? Oh yeah. So it was really hard to let go, but then seeing all the extra time that I have to do Mm. the big things is what's been motivating. Um, I think that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. When you when you actually were looking for a virtual assistant, what did that yeah. process look like for you? So did you find someone through an agency or was it more that you put out your own call for um, an assistant? I often look for people through Upwork mm-hmm. and um, she is from the Philippines and I know I'm helping her. She's a mom and she's been amazing and I just want to give her more hours because I know it's helping her and she helps me. Um, so yeah, I've found a lot of people um, that I work with today through Upwork. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, you've got all this other stuff that you're juggling. You also managed to put out a remarkable amount of social media content (laughs) and record a lot and post really frequently. So how do you decide what content you're putting out? Do you have a regular content calendar? Are you planning that stuff ahead of time or is it more just like sporadic, whatever you're working on that day is what gets posted? Well, I'm going to be honest up until, uh, (laughs) December, I was just doing it sporadic because that's all I, I was literally, it was survival mode. Yeah. And now I'm really syncing it up with my email marketing Mm. and choosing something to focus on. So like last month we were, I was focusing on my whole program and you could get a whole month free. Um, this month I'm focusing on my pop method and I'm just sharing. I mean, I have gazillions of videos cause that's all I do is take videos of my kids and students and stuff. Um, so I'm just sharing a lot of pop songs and, um, stories about my kids. I always say kids. I'm sorry. It's my students, but I just feel like they're my kids. <laughs> all, all the kids. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, I think that moving forward, it's, it's going to be a lot more strategic and I'm getting help with that because Again, like I cannot do it all. And if mm-hmm. I want to be strategic, I need some help. So getting help, but obviously yeah. I'm choosing like the images and the videos and cause like I know my stuff the best, but I'm getting help with the wording because I mean, I'm sure if you notice like my past, um, everything I, I talk, I write like I talk, you know, I just like blah, 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 pour out my heart. Um, it's still very much me, but it's more organized mm-hmm. right now. Which is good. Got it. (laughs) It's hard. I think a lot of people look at social media and I guess if if you're not posting regularly and you've never had to ask for this help on the surface, 
you always just see the creator and you see their face and their wording and their style and everything. And so I think it's easy to assume like, oh my gosh, Tara is doing everything. Like how was she balancing that all by herself? I can't believe she posts so often, but this is kind of a back end, I think for a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and business owners that it's very common to have some kind of social media management or support yes. or copywriting. Someone is helping in yeah. some way. I mean, I haven't had you're... help until now, like literally yeah. until like end of, yeah, it's been like a month and a half that I'm getting help. Otherwise, but it's important to have that support because it, it is a lot yes. to balance. I actually How much time realized... would you say? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. That's okay. Um, up until I've had this help, I cannot believe how much Instagram actually has been weighing on me mentally. Mm. Every single day, like that, I wouldn't post. Like, oh my god, I need to post. I felt like my day wasn't done until I posted. And now that it's like scheduled yeah. out, and I can see, like, I it is the biggest weight that's been lifted off of mm-hmm. my shoulders. I can't even tell you. Um, but I, it's very much me, which is I'm really happy about it. And mm-hmm. I think that it's much more valuable in a lot of ways for teachers. What's what I'm what's being shared right now. Um, but yeah, I had no idea how, how much weight mm. Instagram had on me. Until well, and you're running I multiple accounts. Account. I mean, I think oh, like a, five. Oh, and yeah. oh yeah. There's also like the new business I got this summer piano language and I want to do that justice. And then it's just like, oh my gosh, I, I feel submerged. <laughs> it was just, I'm trying <laughs> to get the help, but get the help. You have to have the money to pay for it. And so it's like a balance and but my sanity also is important. So <laughs> so before you hired yeah. in an average week, and this can totally be a rough estimate, I know I'm putting yeah. it on the spot, but how many hours would you say in a week you were spending on your social media and spending on Instagram? Oh gosh. Um, let's say try, 10. Mm. You know, just, yeah. That doesn't even count probably when you're like scrolling and looking for inspiration yes. too. Yeah, yeah. That's just yeah. like actual just trying to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a lot. This, so now I can actually plan ahead and I can like focus in one hour. I'm like, hey, these are my three posts for next week. You know, here yeah. are my videos or like, oh, I need to do a reel. Like, let me just get dolled up and, you know, film those. And <laughs> that's another whole story is actually like getting dressed and makeup yeah. and stuff, you know, <laughs> do you that's find, so do you find that when you go to record, like, are you recording it, as an example, I had a yeah. conversation with someone recently in another podcast episode where you're talking about this, but I've always done it more like when I'm feeling inspired, like mm-hmm. I have a couple ideas and right now I feel motivated to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and hit record and turn this out. Or do you schedule time for yourself, especially because the kids can't necessarily be there? Like, are you just putting that in your schedule and holding yourself to that? I was trying to, but then mm-hmm. life happens. Like I get no sleep and I literally can't even function that yeah. day. And so then everything I want to do goes out the window Right now, my godmother helps me on Fridays, takes Jordan. So that's like my day to do a lot of stuff. And sometimes instead of getting dolled up and doing that stuff, I just end up doing so much of the work that I'm behind on. So yeah. um, I also, my cousin from France is coming back in February, which is incredible because she was here helping me from September to December. And um, having another person with me 24-7 is literally a godsend. And so I have on my list while she's here, <laughs> I'm going to finish filming my course. I'm going to have her take thousands of pictures of me. <laughs> I don't have to do selfies anymore. I'm like, I have a whole list of everything we get done in two months. Like this is going to be crunch it. time. So <laughs> I have everything scheduled to do in the next two months. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's a lot to balance. And especially when we're looking at your, your profiles, which I mean, you've got several accounts that are like eight to 9,000 followers. Mm-hmm. There's, I think, more expectation around that when you've got a bigger following you feel like okay people are expecting my content i have to keep turning it out and i know that the teachers in your program are probably learning from that content too so there's more pressure like having a big following is something that a lot of teachers want to have but it's a lot of work and it it can come with its own struggles and pressures Mm -hmm. and things like that too so you're doing it. I don't know how you're doing it, but you're managing it all. It's, and so it's seriously funny impressive. Like, <laughs> my Tara and Jane account is like my personal slash artist one. Mm-hmm. That's what I used to live on all the time. Um, but for anyone that knows me, I literally live on Cascade Method. It's my favorite one to be on. <laughs> uh, because just teaching is my passion and my work is my passion. And my goal has been to be a mom and be able to do this. So like, I feel mm. like it encompasses all of me. Like it is Cascade Method is me, you know? 
guitar and chain, like writing music, that's one side of me, but that's, you know, and being a mom, like, but I don't know. I just love my Cascade Method account. I just want to be there all the time and share my babies there. And I know it could go against what people think should be shared, but I'm like, whatever, that's, it's me. <laughs> well, and okay. So th- we get a lot of questions about this. So this is a great little offshoot that I'd love to just okay. go down mm-hmm. with you a little mm-hmm. bit. When you're trying to decide what content to put on what account, it can get complicated. And yes. sometimes people think about separating out like their artist profile from their teaching profile or mm-hmm they their personal from their business. And there are a lot of theories around this, but I think in general, there's no right or wrong way for anyone to run their socials because it should be authentic to you. And yes. what works for one account is never going to work for the next. It's totally fine to have this variation. But what are some of the things in your posting that are exciting for you? Like what are some content pieces that you like churning out? And what are some things that you've maybe tried before, but just didn't really work for you and you're happy that you're not doing them anymore in your content creation? Mm. Um, I mean, it's varied so many, so much over the years. Uh, Mm -hmm. but I mean, I love sharing actual footage of my students and videos. Um, I love sharing my mom's side and showing my babies and stories because it's literally I'm 24 seven with them is how I feel. (laughs) (laughs) It is my life. Like, I don't want to pretend that I like, I have all this time myself. I don't. It's the... I mean, right now we're lucky I even have this time to talk to you. It's the <laughs> that I feel really bad for my brother up there who's probably struggling with both babies. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I feel like, again, just or just uh, was it graphics don't do as well. And I mean, I do mm. like sharing those once in a while, but I feel real, just being real and real images and real videos is what does best. And that's awesome. And it's a lot, it does feature you a lot. It's a lot of your students, but it's also mm-hmm. a lot of you with your students. I think I saw like just in the last day or two, like a post from you, like on zoom, like a screenshot of you oh, on yeah, zoom yeah, with yeah. one of your students yeah, too. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's kind of the, the back end. like, what does it really look like to, to run this business? And what does my life look like at a whole? And I think that's an important part of this when we're talking about where social media is heading. Mm-hmm. I think we like lived in this curated Instagram feed for a long time where people wanted it all to be like the same filter and the same color oh, and yeah. it had to look a certain I way. Keep up with that. I'm just... and first of all, no one can. <laughs> it's so <laughs> yeah. so hard to do. But also it's inauthentic. Like you're picking it's and really choosing so much. It looks calculated. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean I know and that it feels disingenuous. Good, but... I don't know. I don't, I don't have time yeah. for that. I mean, I am, yes. you know, I feel like I'm making a step forward with like being organized and strategic now, but uh, one thing at a time. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that true, genuine approach to social media, mm-hmm. I think, I mean, it's part of why people follow you and not even just your students and their families mm-hmm. and potential students, but also their teachers, because mm-hmm. it is the full picture of mm-hmm. your life. And I think that resonates with people because they obviously have a lot more going on in their lives than just teaching. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, I think, what people want to see on social media in general. So being more authentic and genuine is yeah. something I think we're all working on <laughs> and like relieving ourselves of that pressure to just post the right thing or to be so curious. Oh, yeah. I'm right. not about that. I've always, I, like, I, I, <laughs> I know I told you before, but I'm an open book and I, I authentic is like uh, actually a really important word to me. I love being mm. authentic. I think that I hope I do a good job of doing that because that, um, I don't know. And I also, like my audience, the ones I love are moms. Like if you're a mom or a grandma or like if you've had kids and you like those are my people. And I actually love seeing teachers when they share that in their stories. Like I know you mm. teach. I know you do this in your studio. Let me see also like your real life. Like I, yeah. that's what I love. And I, you know, we go to the the pages or, or their, yeah, their, their actual feed for, you know, their teachings and stuff. But in stories, like share your behind it seems like, you know, absolutely. That's and so what I'm helps. I want to see that. <laughs> it Ooh. attracts people to you in a different way. Cause now it's not just like, Oh, I, I might want to work with Tara and I, I trust her method and she's got all these great skills and look at all the success that she has, but Tara is a good person. Like I like who she is. I mm-hmm. feel like that resonates with me and I feel connected. Um, and truthfully, I hope that's like, what comes across because that's that's oh, what I. Oh yeah, I mean that's what you show up and I mean you show up in my stories all the time on Instagram and I'm most of the time in pajamas, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are lucky when I get dressed. Not it does not happen often. <laughs> but I think that's an important part of it too. Like you don't have to have a full face of makeup on every single yeah. time you want to record a piece of content or you know be yeah. on stories. It's very rare. Um, for me. <laughs> and that's a hard thing for a lot of us to let go of is. Yeah 
like curating that perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I think to be totally transparent around it too, I think there's also a little bit more pressure for women on social media to do that and like to be totally ready. And um, it's just not a realistic picture of our daily lives, especially when we're juggling kids and families and everything else in between. (laughs) Awesome. If you could give one piece of advice, let's say for someone that's starting their career, it it could be in teaching, but it also could just be a general music career. What would you want them to know as they're trying to discern what the right path is for them and where to spend their time and and how to move forward? Um, I'm huge on being passionate about what you do, because Mm. if you love what you do, it doesn't feel like work. And I wake up every day feeling so blessed that I get to do what I do it's not fair that I get paid to do what I do. (laughs) Um, So if I think that you should really find what drives you and what's important to you. Um, And I mean, life can't be better than that when you're doing what you love. So I feel that's what I would say. (laughs) Well, and especially right now, you're talking about the the volume of work and how like the, the season that you're in and everything and that things can, can change. But when you're doing something that you are passionate about that, like someday list keeps growing and like the the excitement and the passion that you have and the goals that you have keep building themselves out ahead of you. What's really interesting. I think about a lot of careers in general, but especially when we're talking about the arts is that you never know what door is going to open for you, or you never know what that next source of inspiration might be. And it's important to stay agile in that, but you can only really stay agile when you're in a place where you're happy Yes. And you're enjoying what you're doing on a baseline. Not that you're not going to have stressful days or not you're not going to be exhausted. Stuff that you don't want to do like, yeah, there's stuff yeah. I don't want to do, but in general, like, it's yeah. Very, yeah. When your baseline level of happiness is higher, I think your yeah. tolerance for all the other things is exactly. higher too, yes. because you're very just well excited to be doing it. Yes. And that's awesome. Mm-hmm. What are some things in business that you, it could be business advice or even just like maybe books that you've read. I know you've kind of mentioned a couple, what are some tools and resources that have just really informed you that you think would be helpful for other people? Um, it's so funny. Cause like I'll pick up certain books and they, I, I happened to pick them up at the right time. Like it was the book mm. that I was supposed to read it. Um, one that like changed me uh, was you're a badass at making money. Oh, Jen Sincero. Yes. That's a great book. That is such oh, a good book. God that I read that book and I changed my policies. I literally like Mm. doubled my rates. I couldn't believe it. And it happened right before my husband passed and thank goodness. Mm. And I added in five weeks of vacation within the year that went along with the school. It was the best decision I ever made. And to anyone listening to this, I just read that book. It will change. (laughs) You are worth. And she's got two. Yes. She's got two. There's the, the a first one was one, you're right? a badass. And yes, then I there's read the you're a badass at making money. Yeah. That's a good one too. Yeah. It, okay. It's really, really good. Okay. What other ones? Now I'm curious. You say uh, they well, keep, I, keep coming into your life at the right time. Oh, I want to know what well, else has been impactful. Another one was like the whole creating systems. It was uh, the e mm. book. And I, it was really hard for me to read and it's old and outdated, I feel, but it really, it, it told me, Tara, you need to create systems. It's time. Like, and mm. I started doing that and that's when I actually hired my virtual assistant started creating videos like this is what I do. This is my process and handing it off to her, handing off as much as I could off my plate. And I, and sometimes I still realize I'm like adding these little things that I could be giving to her. Like, sorry, this is not what you should be doing. You can give this to her. <laughs> you can give this to her. You know, like, <laughs> it's hard having a team and it, it's hard too, because when you give someone like, I, I'm thinking, you know, we have assistants that we work with. And when I send a task list, usually that's a repetitive list. Like there's yes. things that they're doing on a daily basis, a weekly yes. basis, a monthly basis for us. Exactly. But sometimes those little one-off things in your head, it feels like, oh God, if I have to explain this to her, yeah. then but it might, might take more out. time. Yeah. Right. But then if I explain it once and I don't explain it again, and yeah. then they can just handle it. Yeah. It's a learning curve. <laughs> it's it really is. hard. It is. It's hard to let go of doing it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Have you read Everything is Figure Outable by Marie Faleo? No. Okay. That would be a good, I think you might like that one. Okay. Um, she's an interesting career path was like, a, was working in corporate consulting, I think, and then ended up being an MTV dancer, <laughs> like it's just okay. kind of a wild career path, which is really cool. But um, what I like about that book is it's this great approach to a, like finding time in your schedule. So when you're looking at things and feeling overwhelmed, like how do you actually build out time? How do you delegate some of these mm. things um, when you're trying to decide what to do next or what 
potential risks you might want to take in changing things up, and like, you know, creating a safety net for yourself of yes. like imagining the, the worst possible case scenario. Like what really would happen if I started posting on Instagram for the first time ever tomorrow? <laughs> yes. Like what are the worst things that could happen if, you know, it all went awry? Um, and working through some of that to just kind of psychologically get yourself there and ready and build up the tolerance. But she also talks a lot about how things just happen the way they're supposed to, because there's always an option if you're looking for the right door. Yeah. And so aligned with a lot of what you're talking about today. And mm -hmm. I think that'd be a, a, a good read. Okay. That's awesome. Are you a podcast listener at all? Or are you mainly a reader? Neither. I was for Neither. a while more, <laughs> when, when I, when I was driving a lot, I would throw them all like in the car, but yeah. I haven't been in the car a lot and just I'm with the kids and it's impossible to hear and do anything with that. So, but <laughs> it is on my list. Like I, I about a year ago, I was like, listen to one po podcast a week, like read one chapter <laughs> or read a book. Like, but right now it's like, I feel everything is on pause. Yeah. I'm just in survival mode right now. But yeah, that's I'm like, totally I feel like I'm fair. tackling so many things that were on my list of last year to do right now. I'm just starting mm. to like, I get organized, clean things. Like, and I feel like it's really hard for me to do anything when things aren't organized or cleaned up. And as soon, so I'm really focusing on that right now. And I don't know where the energy is coming from. Maybe I'm getting like an extra hour. I don't know of sleep, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I have listened to podcasts. I just right now, not, not right now. All good. All good. <laughs> well, I think maybe to kind of wrap our conversation for today, um, I'd like to highlight two things. And the first is anything that you're working on right now. You know, we've talked about the projects that are coming yeah. up, but anything that you're working on right now that you want to share that you're excited about, and then also where people can find out more information about you and the things that you're working on, um, if they're interested in your method or anything else that we've talked about today. Okay. Well, right now I'm trying to finish up this new course. So I, I released a new book this summer, Hooked on Piano, um, where I uh, offered like a live online group class to kids. And what I'm trying to do is create an evergreen course where like anytime a parent wants a kid to start learning piano, like take this, it, it will not hurt. It can even be supplemental mm. to lessons that you're doing. Anyway, but that's my goal in the next couple of months. Um, but right now I am really sad about my pot method. We all know that. <laughs> I made that clear today. Um, <laughs> and uh, if anyone is interested, like take, I anyway, I have a $50 coupon if anyone wants it. And they can always take this mini course and it can't hurt. <laughs> it can awesome. only be fun for kids and them. <laughs> I'll make sure we put that coupon in the show notes too. So if anyone's right. interested, obviously all of Tara's uh, information and contact details will be in the show notes too. So you can find her, but cascade method on Instagram is just at cascade method on Instagram is where you typically live and hang yes. out the most. So mm -hmm. people should definitely follow you there too. A lot of good content. It's not even like we talked about today. It's not just about the method. It's not just about teaching. It's entrepreneurship in general and all the other things that you're working on. And it's helpful, I think, for everyone to see that back end. So I highly recommend that one. It's a good follow. <laughs> Tara's got great content. Awesome. Thanks Thank so you so much, much for today. This was an absolute blast and it was really fun hanging out with you. You're working on a lot of cool things and I'm excited about what you've got in the works, uh, but Thank also just so thank you for sharing your story and your journey of how you got here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs>